Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. It's nice to see such a wide variety of people on the webinar today. Welcome, everyone. Very warm welcome, whether you're a, a mental health professional or a researcher or a person with lived experience or a parent. We've got a really diverse group of you here today. Uh, that's fantastic. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of what we're going to cover and then I'm going to introduce our panel and then I'm going to ask them some questions. So this webinar is about ADHD and autism in young people um, and we're delighted that we're covering that topic and, and that we've got a really great piece of research that we're going to summarise and discuss in previous campfires that we've had. Um, lots of people have asked for more um, events relating to these two topics um, and so we're really pleased that there's a demand out there for this and that we can discuss how we can support young people. Um, so what we're going to do we're going to start off by talking a bit about what life is like uh, if you have autism and ADHD. Um, we're going to sort of set the scene a little bit. Uh, we're then going to critically appraise a piece of research um, that sounds quite complicated if you're not a researcher, but don't worry. It basically just means we're going to summarise a new piece of research and talk about the strengths and limitations of that, that research and talk about what we're going to do now that we have that research. How can we use it in practice? Um, and so, yeah, it's time to introduce people. So I'm going to ask our um, expert panellists to have, give it a little wave as I introduce them um, so you know who's here in the room. Um, first of all, really happy to introduce Stephanie, uh, Dr. Stephanie Amy, who's a uh, psychiatrist, hi Stephanie, from Canada, um, joining from Toronto, Canada. Uh, she's Associate Director of the Kundil Centre for Child and Youth Depression, a child and youth psychiatrist at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, and it's her review that we're going to look at today. Um, we also have Sam here on the call, uh, Samuele Cortesi, uh, Professor of Psychiatry, uh, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the University of Southampton, and also a practicing consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist uh, in Southampton at the hospital there. Um, oh, that's a mouthful, Sam. Um, uh, we also have Tom, um, who's here today. Tom's joining us um, just via audio. Uh, Tom is our lived experience representative. Very warm welcome, Tom. Really pleased to have you on the call. Um, Tom is a member of the McPin Young People's Network um, and will be chiming in um, on his own uh, experience of this issue. Um, so yeah, great to have you on the call. Thanks for joining us. And then we have Douglas and Celine, my colleagues here at the Cameras Campfire. Douglas Badenoch, who's co-founder of the National Health Service with me, uh, an information scientist. He's got a black belt in critical appraisal skills, so he'll be drawing on those skills uh, later on. Uh, and Celine, Dr. Celine Reichart, who's a clinical lecturer, hi Celine, at King's College London, and Celine's going to be moderating the Zoom chat today. So do say hello in the chat, uh, do use the Q&A function if you want to ask a question of our panel. This is very informal, very conversational, um, so yeah, we'll try and get the most out of it together and see what we can learn. So, I'm going to start off, Sam, by asking you to kind of give us a little bit of kind of context for this. Give us some background. Um, clearly, we're all very different, um, but can you paint a picture of some of the challenges that face young people who are affected by autism and ADHD for us? Sure. Uh, so uh, well, to set the scene, uh, first of all, I think it's probably important to start with a quick um, historical background where uh, we, we started from to understand better what is the problem we discuss. So um, as many uh, delegates to this um, event we know, um, until uh, 2013, the year when uh, one of the two major diagnostic systems we use in psychiatry, the DSM-5, was published, formally it was not possible to diagnose ADHD and ASD in the same individual, because it was thought that if um, a person with ASD has also um, symptoms, problems related to ADHD, typical of ADHD, so hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention, this was in a way accounted for by ASD, by autism. So, um, 
officially was not possible to give this double diagnosis. Uh, this uh, veto was removed in the DSM-5. The concern was that um, actually um, not diagnosing ADHD in individuals with ASD when on top of ASD they present also in attention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, was a problem because prevented them from receiving uh, appropriate treatment for these symptoms, which can be very impairing alongside the symptoms of ASD. So um, the DSM-5 um, committee took the decision to allow the uh, co-diagnosis, the dual diagnosis. Since then, this is important from the research point of view because um, we have more studies that focus on individuals who officially are diagnosed with these two uh, disorders. So more studies mean uh, we are more able to understand uh, the treatment that work and don't work for this particular subpopulation of individuals with ASD. And it goes without saying that uh, many clinicians, uh, you know, used to diagnose ADHD um, in ASD um, well before the DSM-5, regardless of the official indication. But this is important in terms of research because since then the number of studies on this particular population has increased and we can assess better, we can compare them, we can pull them together as Stephanie did in this meta-analysis. So I think this is important as a first point to bear in mind. Second, uh, I think that the focus here is to understand really uh, what is the value, if any, of uh, pharmacological treatment to uh, decrease the severity of the symptoms of ADHD. And as I mentioned earlier, of course, I guess the majority of delegates are aware, but uh, for those who are not very familiar, uh, when we talk about ADHD symptoms, we refer to uh, three core symptoms. We call them core symptoms because they define the disorder. Inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity. Every child has some trait of this, but we call them a disorder when they are excessive in comparison to the developmental stage of the child or the, the individual and when they are impairing. So the question is really, um, what is the value, if any, of pharmacological treatment um, in individuals with ASD plus ADHD for ADHD symptoms? Uh, now, um, when we look at individuals with just ADHD, we do have a quite a large body of evidence. Actually, um, it's quite clear that um, the body of evidence on pharmacologic treatment for ADHD, just ADHD, is the largest body of evidence we have in child adolescent psychopharmacology. These are the most studied medication. They have been there for decades, um, you know, um, from the 40, 50s. So these are quite well-known medication quite controversial, they have always been controversial, but we do have a large body of evidence. We point to the fact that in general for individuals with just ADHD, they tend to be quite uh, efficacious and effective. Actually, we have a large body of evidence from randomized trial uh, that shows that they, they are better than placebo. They are much better in general. They, in, in, in research, we use a term which is the effect size, which means to which extent the medication are better than placebo. And the effect size of this medication are the highest one we have in psychiatry. So better than antipsychotic, antidepressant, anxiolytic, and so on and so forth. Interesting, we also have a large body of evidence from real life studies, because one of the critiques is that, of course, randomized trials are quite artificial, but in real world, it has been shown that this medication in individuals with just ADHD, they decrease significantly important negative outcomes. It has been shown that they lead to a decrease of a criminal act, anti-social act, a physical injuries, car accident, and so on and so forth. They do have side effects as all medication, but I would say the good news, so to speak, is that in general, side effects are temporary, they can be managed, and they lead to discontinuation of this treatment just in a minority of patients. So overall, we, we, we can say that even if there are concerns around the quality of the evidence, we can talk about this later on, in general, evident, available evidence point to positive effect of this medication with a, an important impact in daily life. 
Now, the question we are discussing today with the paper uh, uh, Stephanie led as a senior author is, uh, what is the efficacy? So how well do they work in trials? And what is the tolerability? So do they have side effects are well are tolerated in individuals who, in addition to ADHD, have also ASD? Because uh, we may expect, you know, maybe the, the effect is the same, but it may be different. So we really need a, a systematic uh, appraisal of the evidence and analysis to, to answer this question, because this is important when we discuss with our patient, we need to provide uh, solid information to, uh, to, to reach, uh, to have a decision, a shared decision in terms of the choice of the medication and understanding their beneficial effect and their limitations. So I think this is really the question that we address today. Yes, thank you. Great, that's a great introduction. I want to kind of broaden it out a little bit. And before we get into talking specifically about how well medication works to treat ADHD in people who have autism as well, I'd like to kind of open it up to the rest of the panel, really, just to kind of reflect on, as I said earlier, you know, what life is like if you have autism and ADHD, um, how, how you kind of interact with the world, what the challenges are specifically that, that face you. I don't know if anybody else on the panel wants to come in on that. Oh, Tom, you've got your hand up. Would you like to speak now? Um, I think being autistic and having symptoms of ADHD can at times be really, really tough and hard, um, especially when there's a little or no awareness that uh, from other people that you have it. But at the same time, it can be quite easy or um, sort of, yeah, it, it, it can be quite easy to um, accept and go by if you have the right people who cheer you on or support you. So I guess um, there's not really a definitive answer in from my opinion, um, in terms of what our life is like um, for someone who has ADHD and autism. And it's important to say that um, people will feel differently on this. But what I do think we'd all agree on is that it's easier for us when and this life is so better and more pleasant um, when we have people who are there for us and yeah, you can recognize some of our difficulties and needs and yeah adjustments thank you it's so good to have your voice um as part of the conversation tom thank you so much for joining us i think it's really important that we uh can kind of ground what we're thinking about here today uh, in, in the lived experience of people like yourself. So it's really fantastic that you've, uh, you've been able to join us. I'm sure we can come back to you later. Do chime in with your thoughts as we go along, please. Um, Stephanie, do you want to kind of add to that at all? Well, no, I think Tom said it uh, really perfectly that, um, you know, there's uh, such a variety of uh, experiences and, you um, you know, uh, individuals who have, uh, who are on the autism spectrum, they have a variety of mental health, physical health, uh, co-occurring disorders that, that can um, uh, increase impairment and make it uh, even more difficult over and above um, some of the uh, challenges that are associated with, with being on the autism spectrum to function in, in certain settings, especially when the person environment fit is not, is not quite um, aligned very, very nicely. So um, yeah, I think that um, being on this panel is, is a wonderful privilege and it's a, a really great opportunity for um, our paper to be highlighted um, and, and featured uh, in this edition of the campfire. Maybe I'll, I'll take a moment uh, now to talk a little bit about what the impetus was for, for our paper. That's yeah, okay. Please, please. All right. 
Okay. So um, uh, this paper was, uh, it was really a team effort. So I'm here representing our, our big team. Um, and it was a, a collaboration between uh, a, a bunch of uh, clinicians and clinician scientists who tend to have more expertise on the ASD and the ADHD um, sort of management clinical trial side. And then we, th those were folks at the University of Toronto, and we collaborated with some methodologists at the University of Western Ontario. So my co-senior author on this paper is Dr. Kelly Anderson, and then this, the first author was Rebecca Rodriguez, who really undertook a lot of the method-based thinking about the systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, and then the clinicians really kind of took that and tried to, to really translate it into a synthesis and a guidance um, uh, to help clinicians in the field who are trying to make decisions and help uh, families and young people that they're working with to sort of figure out what um, the best way forward is in terms of uh, management of ADHD symptoms and ASD. And so um, some of the factors that, that led into uh, us undertaking this um, systematic review and meta-analysis and then the, the knowledge synthesis piece with um, in the practitioner review was um, one, there had been a, a, a bit of time since the previous sort of pathways had been published. So it was about 2012, 2013 that the Autism Treatment Network, which is a North American um, network of clinicians and, and families, um, had undertaken um, a clinical pathway um, uh, 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 um, undertaking as well as um, a narrative review of the literature. And at that time, there was really just um, clinical trials and, and most of them um, were not RCTs that they reviewed um, uh, that focused on methylphenidate treatment. And then the next year, there was another um, uh, systematic review. There was a systematic review and meta-analysis led by RIFO. And uh, that looked tried to look at uh, medications broadly, but at the time, really, there was still only methylphenidate, that you could really pool what, what Samuel was talking about in terms of pooling effect sizes to really synthesize what the evidence was um, uh, across trials that were available. Um, since then, there have been a few studies that have looked at one medication class um, but no update that looked across classes. And we've had uh, um, a small number of additional uh, studies that are um, uh, sort of what we call kind of the, the highest um, uh, rigor in terms of design RCTs, randomized control trials that had been published that we wanted to put together. And so we really wanted to, to provide um, for the clinicians out there um, a comprehensive guide that looked across different medication classes that we could compare um, what the evidence looked like to the extent that we could. Um, and so that was part of the impetus. And then in the background, we see that the rates of um, uh, medication prescriptions in uh, young people on the autism spectrum are going up. ADHD is uh, one of the most common reasons why medications are, are prescribed in autism. And um, they're also the, probably the primary reason for long-term use of medication. Um, and so we wanted to, to go back and, and be able to um, pool all the evidence that we have um, and look across different medication classes to see one, what's the evidence of efficacy, what are adverse effects looking like, but then we wanted to kind of go beyond what had been published previously and, and really to talk to, to look at what Samuel was talking about before, which is kind of more of the everyday impact, the, the um, importance of, of outcomes that, that maybe have more meaning to, to individuals. Um, um, some of those that we were wanting to look at were, were everyday functioning, school functioning, um, and oppositional defiant disorder symptoms. So really, we wanted to kind of go back, uh, give a comprehensive guide, look across different domains, and then really synthesize the, the literature so that we can give kind of an updated pathway for the clinicians who are undertaking decision making with their uh, patients and families in this arena. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm interested, first of all, before we talk about the evidence and the pathway that you're kind of recommending, what happens currently to, to treat and manage ADHD in young people who have autism. Do you want to start, Stephanie, by telling us what happens in Canada? Do you know? Uh, I don't think we know in a systematic way. 
I mean, I can definitely tell you anecdotally uh, amongst my colleagues and, and what our experiences are. But, but um, typically, you know, un unfortunately, we still in, in child psychiatry and in a lot of areas of medicine, um, we don't necessarily use standardized pathways. So um, treatment approaches may differ quite a bit depending on what clinician um, you, you happen to be able to get access to. So that's definitely our experience. Um, uh, so the approach, what medication might be tried first, whether behavioral interventions get tried before medications, and even kind of the, the rigor in terms of the assessment of ADHD and ASD varies quite a lot from clinician to clinician. Um, and so, so we're, we're moving towards uh, standardized pathways and what we call kind of measurement-based care, where we're trying to really standardize our approaches, use similar outcomes, but we're really not there yet. Um, so that's a little bit about, about what, what the experience is like. Okay, thank you. And how about here in the UK, Sam? Um, we know that I think it's something like one in three young people with autism have symptoms of ADHD. Um, how, is, how is that managed currently within the health service? Sure. So interesting, I think when we look at the treatment, we should always look also at what is the outcome. So what are the things that we want to change? Because it's possible the different intervention do different things. So when we look at ADHD, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it is defined by uh, three core symptoms. So if we look at the effect of treatment just on these three core symptoms, inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, evidence in general suggests that the pharmacologic treatment is the best approach to decrease the severity of these uh, problems. And arguably, many uh, clinicians in camps, in normal camps, tend to use this medication in children with ADHD, with or without ASD, to tackle um, ADHD symptoms. However, we do know that ADHD is much more than these three symptoms. Beyond uh, this triad, there is a person with um, strengths, difficulties. So looking broadly at other outcomes, uh, like, I don't know, sleep, uh, and more broadly, quality of life, and so on and so forth, we, we, we clearly uh, understand that, you know, uh, it's an individual pharmacologic treatment is probably not enough. So um, we really need to uh, consider that the way these individuals are treated is quite different according to uh, the, the clinical picture, the needs, the strength. And so, you know, um, Hopefully, when we move beyond the diagnosis to look at the formulation, this will suggest additional treatments, additional interventions. So uh, clearly, uh, if we look just at the ADHD core symptoms, it's, it's quite common to, to see these in, uh, children or adults treated with ADHD medication. But in addition to this, there may be all a panel of other interventions. And it goes without saying that, um, of course, this depends on to which extent these are available in, in the service, because uh, you know, we can read guidelines and recommendations that provide some hierarchy of treatments, but when it comes to the reality, if uh, there are no therapies trained on particular uh, therapies, uh, then uh, uh, practitioners are left with the option of the medication. Uh, so um, the, the, the availability of uh, treatment uh, also uh, influences the way these individuals are treated. But definitely, I would say that. Yeah. Oh, so that you need to mute. Um, thank you, Sam. And I think that's really pertinent for all the people that are joining the webinar from low and middle income countries. I noticed when people were introducing themselves, there were all sorts of places. So I think the availability of treatment is is clearly an issue not just in the UK but all over the world yes yeah, Stephanie I just want to add to that because I think that's a really important point especially in the current climate I mean we're uh, globally we're all still dealing with this pandemic and the availability of psychosocial interventions have have shifted uh, uh, virtually um, in, in a lot of settings uh, and people have, lose, have lost services and lost critical access to school supports. And so, you know, we are seeing in Canada that um, across, you know, mental health um, prescribers tend to be 
um, uh, drawing on what they can in terms of their toolboxes and, and relying more on medications because just the access to psychosocial interventions have, have diminished um, in, in this climate. I, want, I noticed, Tom, you put your hand up there. I wondered if you had anything to add about your own experience of what, what support people get currently in the UK. No pressure to say anything if you don't want to, but yeah. Um, there is support people get in the UK. Um, I think that the main support I'm aware of is adaptations. Sorry, Tom, could you say that again? The main support people get is? Um, so the main support I'm aware of is adaptations to adaptations. Um, the environment. Yes. So like in, in a work setting, for example, <clears throat> people with autism and ADHD may be also specialist equipment or somewhere where they're sort of less sensitive to noise and light. Um, and I know there's um, other specialist support which can be put in place or considered, like um, having uh, um, an organization with expertise come to provide some sort of diagnosis or treatment or care plan with occupational health. Um, but I think we, with support um, and our help that is provided, it is fair to say we can't ever be complacent about what people need or might need going forward. I think as the research which has been carried out show, there's not going to be a point where we can put things to rest there's always going to be something new that comes about or needs to change and may affect what we know so I think even with thinking about support and how we help with medical conditions in general or more specifically with something like ADHD and ASD it's important to recognize that as well um, because I think personally if some people were more aware of that and took it into account it would have helped um, me and other people who have had some experiences of not getting the right interventions in at the right time Thank you. That's a loud and clear message. <clears throat> I think it feels to me like we're at the very start of a journey to support neurodiverse individuals and to change society in a way which is much more um, better organised for, for everyone who lives in it. Um, but yeah, that's a really clear message. Thank you, Tom. Um, Okay, I'm just looking at the clock and we need to move on now to the to the next part of the webinar. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Douglas, um, who is going to talk specifically now about um, the review that Stephanie and her colleagues recently published and is going to give you some pointers as to how we can look at this kind of research. So yeah, over to you, Douglas. Thanks very much. I think that's been a really, really fascinating introduction and set the scene for this research really, really well. So my thanks to my colleagues, especially Tom, for uh, for contributing. Uh, Matt, I was wondering if you could pop up the next poll question. Um, we're now going to look at a piece of research, which is a systematic review. But I just wanted to get a quick feel from the audience. What your knowledge of systematic reviews is? Um, so are you someone who can do systematic reviews? Are you somebody who can read them? Uh, or are you someone who can learn about them? So I would, it would be very helpful and would affect which slides I, uh, I show depending on your response to that question. 
what we're trying to do with the systematic review is very much what we've got in this clinical situation where we have lots of different research, lots of different interventions. We've got different, different drugs that are used. We've got different ways of, of slightly different ways of measuring outcomes. Um, and so the idea of something that brings together all of the existing evidence and um, uh, presents it in a single place uh, is obviously something that, that is going to be very useful for us. Uh, thanks very much, Matt. We've got the results now. So uh, I think we could probably do with a quick introduction, which just maybe tells folk what systematic reviews are. So I'll try to be quite quick about this. Hopefully you can all see the slides now. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so as I said, we can have a, a, a number of different studies on a topic. Here we've got four studies. Let's imagine we've got red pills and green pills and we're comparing their performance uh, and we want to try and find out an answer. Is the red pill better than the green one? You look at that data, you can see there is a bit of inconsistency and that's something that we quite often see when we look, there's conflicting evidence or evidence that seems to conflict. So the idea of a systematic review is that we combine it all and not just put it all in a big mess, we extract the data from each study and try to find a definitive answer. Uh, and in this case, you can see each, each study is represented by a line on the graph. If that horizontal line crosses the line in the middle, that means there's no difference between the two treatments or that's not statistically significant. But once we combine the data at the bottom, the, the lozenge shape at the bottom, shows you that the results overall favour the red pill as opposed to the green one in this instance. So that effectively is what we're doing with a systematic review and in this case a meta-analysis where we, we combine all the data to, to try and get a definitive result. Now what happens if our review is not systematic is that we can run into problems. So this is why they're called systematic reviews and not reviews of stuff that I happen to have lying around in my, on my desk. It, in this case, um, studying at C, let's say our, our search for evidence missed that study, we would get a different result. So with study C, uh, it shows fit in favor of red, but then but if we lose that, then we've lost that, the clarity of that evidence. Um, so it's very important that systematic reviews find everything that's been done on the question. The other kind of crucial thing about systematic reviews is that uh, it, they manage the situation where there might be slight differences between treatments or between the patients who were involved in the study or between the outcomes that they measured. So in this case, we've got a purple pill. Now, is that different enough from a red pill? We need, so so the, what the researchers in the systematic review need to do is to come up with a way of managing all the different studies. So we're not combining apples and oranges, we're actually combining things that it's, it's okay uh, to combine. And those are kind of the two crucial things you're looking for when you're reading a systematic review. And just the high level message is this is what, why we do them. Um, they give you an unbiased overview of what's already known We've got a better chance of providing reliable answers to people's questions, more precise estimates of the effects of treatments. We reduce waste in research by stopping doing studies when we don't need to. Um, and there's also pretty good evidence that by not doing them in the past, we people have suffered harm as a result. Um, I've, I've got a very quick example. You feel free to follow up the reference. There's a really good paper here, but in Take the example of caught death, but some of us will remember that uh, in the, the campaigns in the 80s and 90s to put children on their backs to, to sleep, little babies, rather than on the front. Now, for years, people had been advised to put babies down to sleep on their front. Uh, 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 Dr. Spock, for example, um, his book Baby and Child Care recommended putting babies to sleep on their front because they thought they might asphyxiate. If they vomit in their sleep, they might asphyxiate. And so there was a kind of rationale behind that advice. 
But when we look at the studies that people had done, we find if you look at the, the top half of this graph, the studies are all kind of all over the place. Uh, and they're, they're sort of small studies, they're over a long period of time. Um, and as time went on and people started to do more research into it, then we started to get more data. So what the second half of this graph shows is what if we'd been doing systematic reviews as we went along? If we'd been combining this pool of data into one and doing an analysis on it? Well, it's quite stark. We would have known in about 1970 that we should put babies on their back to go to sleep. Uh, and you can see quite clearly how the estimate gets more precise as we add more data to it. So this is what we're trying to do with this question. We're trying to get as much data as we can that's valid to combine and get as precise a measure uh, of the benefits. And this hopefully uh, shows you why people think systematic reviews are so important. The other thing to say is that reviews do need to take account of the risk of bias in health research. Now I'm not going to do a big lecture on this, there's some great links in those if you want to, to, to follow, uh, follow it up. Quite often we, we talk about bias and if you're new to research you might be thinking, hang on, what? How come these researchers are biased? What's going on? But it's, it, it's not just simple as that. There are, there are things, about, things we know about the way we do studies that we know can lead to uh, systematic error in the results uh, in one way, one direction or another. And usually where bias exists, it, it, it tends to favor treatments. So there's a, there's a good list of studies there if you want to follow that, that, that up. But this underlines what uh, Stephanie said early on that randomized trials are considered to be the best design for this type of research because uh, they're less, least likely to be biased, to be affected by bias. So how do we apply this process to systematic reviews? Um, so what I've got here on the screen is just a, a effective copy lifted a checklist of questions from CASP, which is a critical appraisal skills program. And there's another link there that you can, you can follow if you want to um, uh, uh, follow that up. Um, Basically, we break this down into um, does the review address a clearly focused question? Um, and within that, we look for that, risk, that systematic review plan to be published in advance so that we know how they're going to go about doing the review and we can check their progress. Uh, we need to make sure that they looked for the right type of study. Did we need to make sure that they evaluated it correctly, that they, they did enough to find everything so we haven't missed important data, uh, and to assess whether it makes sense to combine it all. So those are the, these are the questions that we run through when we're looking at uh, doing a critical appraisal of, uh, of a review. So we're gonna move on now. Sorry, that's the, that's the very uh, speed read guide to critical appraisal of systematic reviews for someone who's, who's never heard of them. Um, uh, but please feel free to follow up those links uh, for more detail. We, we've already heard quite, I think, in quite good detail about the background of, uh, of this research. But an important thing I think that's helpful to look at when you're reading a review are the inclusion criteria, because that will list all the different, all the types of, of participants, all the interventions that they evaluated and the outcomes that they measured at the end. So running through the checklist, um, we, we can, have, we can see, see, we've already discussed the, the question. It's quite a complicated question because we we're interested in side effects and we're interested in different ki kinds of, uh, of, of, of treatments as well. Um, we looked for randomised trials and I think this is a case where you did a lot of work, Stephanie, and your team, you and your team to make sure that you found everything. So you did, as well as searching databases, you contacted the authors, you looked at the, the lists of tables of contents because sometimes databases contain errors and don't contain everything. Sometimes an author will know about a study where there's data that hasn't been published. So that's, it's, they pretty much did as, uh, as much as is humanly possible to, to find all the important uh, studies. Uh, they also, went through a process of evaluating the quality of those studies and of extracting the data. And, th and they did that 
with by checking their work as they went along. And the, the, the kind of gold standard here is that you have more than one reviewer looking at the data and they, they compare notes independently from one another to, to make sure that they've, they've got a consistent, uh, a consistent conclusion. So we can see all these steps uh, described in the paper. Um, and as well as uh, conducting a meta-analysis where they put all the, the, the data, they, they tested whether that data would, would whether the, the, the findings varied uh, to test their assumptions. So there's, uh, you could have techniques called sensitivity analysis and a heterogeneity test that you can apply, fancy statistics that will tell you whether, is there a risk this data has been affected by bias? Or, or are there, is there, are there important differences between the studies that, that, so we should be cautious about combining them? So quite a lot there. Um, I th this is a study of which, where everything is quite clearly reported and uh, it, it passes the, the muster with flying colors, I think, on the CAS checklist. We now then move on to think about the results. Are they important? And this figure in the in the paper is one uh, which kind of distills all the, the main outcomes into one uh, uh, into one graphic. And you can you can just glance at that graph, and you can see that the results tend to favour uh, drug treatment. Uh, that within each drug, they're quite consistent. What's quite interesting about the way the results have been presented here is that we can see whether the outcomes are assessed by parents, teachers, whether they're uh, in, or assessed by investigators uh, or, or specialists, the, the, the patterns are similar. So that kind of gives us a bit of um, comfort on the apples and oranges front. It looks like the, within these groups, the studies are looking at, at similar things and showing a similar effect. The results themselves, I think, are, are something, it, it, it's worth just mentioning how they're, they're presented. When we measure hyperactivity uh, or ADHD symptoms, generally we use a scale, uh, a, a score that's derived from, 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 from scoring different systems, uh, different symptoms, sorry. And um, so there's a question then of how you combine those from different studies, or, or sorry, how you compare the different groups. Basically, what the researchers do is they look at the mean improvement in the in the drug treatment group and compare it to the mean improvement in the control group. So they're they're looking at the average difference, uh, average improvement, if you like, in the two groups and comparing them. So that's a very important distinction to make because averages are very useful when you're talking about populations. Um, the, there can be variations, of course. Averages can conceal a bit of, you could have outliers. So it, sometimes it's not the full story, but uh, it, 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 it does mean that we can get a fairly um, reliable measure of the overall effects in the population in general that we're dealing with. So in the blog that, we, that goes along with this session, we've um, uh, put together a table based some of the data from, from the paper, some of it from the, um, uh, uh, the supplementary information, which people will find useful if they want to explore the results more uh, in more detail. Uh, and, and so here you can see so both, I suppose, you see the good and the bad of, of this evidence uh, in this one table. We show that there are effects on hyperactivity and beneficial effects on hyperactivity and on it in attention for some of the treatments. Um, but there's a, there are question marks about the individual studies, some of them very small or they were very short term. Um, and I guess that's something that we could talk about in a bit more detail, Stephanie, when we come to explore the implications in a minute. Um, there's also people are concerned about side effects. Uh, and there's a really valuable table of information which lists all of the side effects that were reported across all the different interventions, which uh, w will be very helpful to people. I guess uh, that might be a, something that is worth picking up in the discussion afterwards. We, we mentioned it at the start, um, but there, there are things that we know about and, and we may be able to, to deal with. So my conclusion of this appraisal was 
we can see some consistent evidence of benefit, particularly in hyperactivity symptoms. Um, we've got some limitations in the evidence as it's presented, specifically in this population, um, around long-term studies, around perhaps we need some bigger studies. Uh, and there's also outcomes that we were interested in looking at, that there's the, the evidence is slightly patchy. It's not fully reported, uh, perhaps. And not, not all the studies recorded the outcomes about quality of life, about um, uh, uh, you know some of the other things that might might matter more to to, to patients and uh, and families. Um, so these are the, perhaps some of the recommendations we can make for future evidence. Um, but I think we're in a situation here where uh, we need to think about uh, the, the decision making can can benefit from uh, uh, this evidence about studies that have been done since the last review, so in the last sort of eight to 10 years. Uh, I, and it, I think it clarifies the picture on the things that we need to balance when we're making decisions about offering this, the, this kind of treatment. So thanks, Matt, you've put up the, the, the next question and uh, it'll be interesting to see what people's responses are. And while we're filling it in, uh, I'll pass back to the team to, um, I think it would be interesting, particularly as we said, pick up some of the issues around the evidence that you found, Stephanie, and what, what, what you know, wh where is there other evidence that can plug some of these gaps that we already know about? Um, that, that would be particularly interesting to know about. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks, Douglas. Yeah, over to you, Stephanie. What do you think of what Douglas has said about your review, first of all? Well, uh, thank you very much. I guess I, I can sort of um, wipe uh, the, the beads of sweat off my, off my forehead to, to make sure that uh, we did a good job. I mean, we really did try and, and pull together a, um, a good team that we could um, really uh, um, present a rigorous review and, and meta-analysis and then also really synthesize it. And, and Rebecca Rodriguez really deserves a lot of kudos, you know, it was her idea to bring in that table that lists all of the different um, uh, medication classes together, which I really think um, helps a clinician to, to, who's kind of maybe pressed for time and really trying to, to sort of get an overview of, of uh, what um, the treatment literature looks like and really can sort of see um, a comparison between these different studies. Um, you know, some of the things that I think is, is really worthwhile to highlight, which, which you already highlighted um, uh, in terms of the con conclusions, is that um, we're, we're really still in early days in terms of um, uh, addressing the, the evidence gaps um, that, are, that remain in terms of ADHD treatment and ASD and in, in terms of uh, um, treatment of um, the majority of co-occurring mental health conditions uh, in autism. So I, I saw from the chat, which I've been monitoring a little bit, that there's lots of questions about, you know, the the um, the heterogeneity that we see uh, um, that that Tom has described uh, among our autistic individuals. That really, you know, when you describe somebody who has autism, it's really one person and. Uh, um, there are uh, elevated rates of uh, co-occurring mental health conditions ac across um, common mental health conditions that we see, you know, elevated rates of anxiety, of depression, of psychosis, of um, suicidal thinking. Um, and so those are all things that we have to think about. Sorry, I don't know if my audio just cut out a little bit. Is it okay? No, it's fine. You're okay. Okay, good. Um, in terms of the, the literature that we reviewed, definitely some of the things that, that are, are uh, continue to be issues that, that need to be addressed are, you know, small sample sizes, short durations of, of, um, of studies, so we really can't say anything about long-term efficacy. Um, we, in our search for clinically meaningful secondary outcomes in terms of looking at oppositional defiant disorder symptoms, everyday functioning, school functioning, there's really very little that has been um, uh, written about and, and evaluated systematically in the literature in this, in, in this sort of co-occurring um, uh, presentation of ASD and ADHD. And there's lots of heterogeneity. So there are a lot of um, different
differences between studies um, in terms of what we found with respect to uh, effects. And some of that heterogeneity reduced a little bit when we looked at um, medication dosages. So this is particularly for, for methylphenidate. We've, we did some sensitivity analyses, as Douglas mentioned, where we looked at different dose effects. And we saw that there was a hint that um, uh, the effect sizes might be larger with medium and high doses as opposed to low doses. And that improved some of the heterogeneity between studies, but there was still um, significant heterogeneity that remained uh, um, amongst a lot of the outcome measures. So, you know, there's still a lot of this fine tuning nuanced approach that we, we can't really answer with the literature. And that's where, you know, we hope that this paper really provides an opportunity um, for the clinician to kind of get a broad comprehensive look at what's available and, and have um, a frank discussion um, with their patients and their um, and the families that they're working with that um, to to clarify you know what what would be uh, an appropriate choice for that specific individual based on their circumstances, their classroom environment, uh, how engaged their teacher is, what are the available behavioral interventions that you can draw on first before thinking about medications, which is part of our pathway, which maybe we'll have some time to discuss. Yeah, let's look at that now, shall we? Because there's a lot of people asking in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the chat, what's what's this pathway all about? And unfortunately, the pathway is part of the paper, which is not an open access paper, so we can't share it with you guys, publishers. I don't know, um, but we have got some slides that Douglas can share. So maybe Stephanie, you could just talk us through the pathway and just tell us what your review is recommending in terms of treatment, and particularly focusing on. Um, the first line of treatment. So you're, you're, you're not recommending medication as the first place that clinicians go. You're recommending behavioral support. So what, what does that mean, behavioral support? Yeah, so there, there's um, good evidence from the non-ASD literature that behavioral interventions really help. Um, so these are um, strategies, learning strategies that can be taught to parents and, and, and a lot of teachers will have formal education around these strategies. And it's really to enhance one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, strategies to kind of help people redirect their attention towards um, the topic matter. So if you have that one-on-one -on -one support to make sure people kind of don't get so distracted, um, that can help quite a lot. Um, uh, if you, you chunk information, so you break down information rather than giving somebody 10 questions, they do two questions, they take a break, they come back, that tends to enhance their ability to attend and get work done. Um, being close to the teacher, reducing background noises, all of those things are sort of in the realm of behavioral interventions. Um, and they can be broader than that in terms of ASD. I mean, really, from an, uh, in terms of the, the treatment um, evidence that we have for um, supporting individuals who have autism, who are on the autism spectrum, behavioral interventions are number one, not medications. Medications are um, facilitators uh, that sometimes are needed um, to target specific symptoms, but it's really those behavioral interventions parent um, support for parents to kind of learn some strategies of how to um, engage their their um, children in in um, in subject matter and and uh, for teachers as well so that's kind of the the first line and yeah. from the non-ASD literature we know that if you start with that that actually seems to improve efficacy outcomes we don't know that from ASD but that seems to be um, uh, the case in in uh, non-ASD ADHD and, and so conscious, once you've, yeah. Sorry, I'm just conscious of time. We've only got a few minutes left and I yeah. wanna get through the pathway yeah. for people because there's three more slides yeah. after this one. So maybe we could move on to the next one and talk about once it comes to a choice about medication, what the process is. So I'm gonna distill it down because I think we only have one minute left. So um, really uh, from the 2012 pathway, the key differences are the first line medication treatment is methylphenidate. That was the same in the 2012 pathway, but the second line um, has changed. So now we've bumped down the evidence, the, the sort of um, um, level of amphetamines. We don't have any studies of amphetamines in ASD, and we're concerned that maybe 
tolerability will be an issue because we see tolerability problems and lower effect sizes for methylphenidate and we think that tolerability might be an issue for amphetamine. So if, if young people don't have um, significant problems with tolerability with methylphenidate, you can use amphetamines as a second choice, but if there are significant tolerability issues, we kind of suggest that you just um, um, go down the, the, the second line choices to atomoxetine and guanfacine, which are medications that we do now have um, RCT level evidence in autism and ADHD. So atomoxetine and guanfacine and amphetamines are all second line choices. Um, and that's kind of the overview. And there's lots of details in the paper that, that people can go through. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to kind of um, bring Sam in now. I, I, just a very general question, Sam, because I think the people who've been watching the presentation and looking at the evidence that this review brings together might be surprised that actually we don't have very good evidence for using medication for ADHD symptoms in people with autism. Um, yeah, is that a concern to you that we're actually doing this in practice, but we have quite poor evidence for it? Yeah, well, I would say that it's important, it's crucial to bear in mind that uh, evidence synthesis, even very good one as this one, is just one of the elements that um, guide clinical decision making. There are also a specific characteristic of the patient, preferences of the patient, and also the expertise, the experience of the practitioner. So that sometimes if, you, if the clinical guidelines based on evidence suggest that you should use A, but for some reasons you use B, that could be okay. So I would say that um, definitely, uh, you know, medications are uh, one of the elements in our armamentarium are not the only one, but they can help. They don't always help, but they help. And I'm sure that, you know, let's say, if tonight I, I call my patients who have ASD and ADHD, and I told them, uh, starting from tomorrow, you will need to stop your medication because the evidence is low. I bet that I will have a lot of phone calls tomorrow. Very anxious. So um, I guess that um, we always need to take this with a grain of salt and as a something that can guide, but we know that even the best evidence can change over time and it should be taken into a global um, uh, perspective. Also, in terms of the quality of evidence, it's very important to bear in mind that the way we um, rate it, it depends a lot on the type of information that is available from the paper and on that particular study. Uh, when there is, it is not clear how a certain aspects of the study were conducted, we usually rate it as uncertain, which uh, downgrades the level of the evidence. But this doesn't mean that necessarily the study was bad. It just meant that we don't have information. Actually, in another meta-analysis we conducted on ADHD and network meta-analysis, we, we took um, uh, almost uh, 18 months to contact all the authors to clarify with drug companies. And after gathering this unpublished information, the quality of the evidence increased because we had more elements to, to say, you know, the better evidence. So I'm not saying that the evidence is necessarily good, but I'm saying that we need to consider that this is not the absolute truth. Um, um, I think that another uh, element important that was highlighted there uh, was around the fact that we have information in the short term. And of course, in the clinical practice, we don't treat for 12 weeks, we treat for more. So um, we, we need more evidence on that. And there are some studies that allow us to understand um, the, the long-term effects. For instance, the so-called withdrawal trials, where people who have been treated, they continue the treatment or are randomized to placebo, so they discontinue them. We can see if there is a maintenance of the effect. There are studies in ADHD without ADHD showing that medication seems to maintain a certain effectiveness, but um, probably less than the one we have in the short term. So we need more study on this. And once again, I think Finally, the key message, I think the, the key aspect is really, we really need to consider that not all medication are made equal. Uh, so some medication are better than others. One of the key messages from this review is that probably antipsychotics don't have, should not have a major role in this. And this is concerning because the rate of antipsychotics are, are increasing. 
quite probably, even if not, even if it's not a large evidence uh, body of evidence, we do have more data on stimulants in terms of effectiveness and tolerability. And second, of course, once again, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it's really important that the, the target, what we want to improve, uh, so that medication may improve some aspect, but not others. So they may be complementary to uh, behavioral therapy, non-pharmacologic treatment, vice versa, non-pharmacologic treatment may not necessarily tackle some aspects that are um, uh, improved by medication. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, we're running over time, so apologies for that. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining us to our expert panel. We've got great feedback there, so thanks everyone for that. Thank you to Stephanie, to Sam and to Tom, who've all uh, shared their thoughts brilliantly. Um, thanks also to Douglas and to Celine for their fantastic involvement. And for everyone who's joined us today, much appreciated. Um, do tweet about Cam's Campfire and tell people all about it. We're going to be running these sessions every month um, throughout the rest of the year and we'll be uh, announcing the topics that we're going to be covering over the next few months in the next few days. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for joining us everyone and we'll see you next time around the campfire. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.